Hello Internet and welcome to this week's edition of One Minute News from One Minute Economics, an edition dedicated to the famous or infamous Bitcoin fork, also known as split or however else you want to call it. And I think that regardless of whether or not this ends up actually happening on the 1st of August, it makes sense to understand the phenomenon because something like this can happen in the future as well and it does make sense to be prepared. So here's what we're going to do. One, I'm going to start by dedicating a minute to explaining how we got here in the first place and what the main problem is. Two, I'm going to spend another minute explaining uh, what the two sides are in this debate and what's causing issues. And finally, three, I'm going to explain what would happen if a Bitcoin fork or split were to take place and what you can do to protect yourself. The main issue that fuels this debate is the fact that Bitcoin as a network is too slow and or expensive. And yeah, for example, the Bitcoin network can right now handle about six transactions per second, which is ridiculously low compared to, for example, Visa that can handle 1600 per second. So something definitely needs to be done. And let's start by understanding how Bitcoin works. It is based on what is called a blockchain. So imagine a huge register that contains information about all transactions that have ever taken place. And this register consists of a gazillion pages. The register is called the blockchain and each page is called a block. And basically each page or block is filled with transactions. And a transaction is a string of data like this account has sent money to this account in the amount of this much and has paid the miner this fee because there's a minor fee in Bitcoin as well. Also, there's this significant amount of data about called the witness or the signature about whether or not the sender has enough money to make the transaction in the first place. And I'm going to talk a bit about, about this later on. So this is how things work. And basically you fill a page with transactions and then you add that page to the register. Rinse and repeat. And the problem is that processing a page or a block takes, if I'm not mistaken, about 10 minutes. And this puts users in a bit of a predicament because one, as it is with Bitcoin not being mainstream, sometimes those who pay a low minor fee have to wait hours or even days for their transactions to finish processing. Two, you can, of course, pay the miners more and speed up the process because by paying the miners more, you're going to have a preferential placement. And obviously, this means that the transaction will go through faster, but then Bitcoin becomes expensive. So yeah, that's pretty much what's causing this entire debate. Let's now take a look at the two parties that are involved in this debate. On the one hand, we have the people who manage the open source software, the community, and on the other hand, we have the miners who allocate processing power to keep the network running. And obviously both parties want the problem to be fixed, but they have different visions about this, about how this can be done. Now, the community says something simple. It says, wait a second. As I've mentioned previously, each transaction contains a signature and that signature uh, represents two thirds of the content. So obviously a lot of space is occupied by the signature or the witness. So the community says, okay, let's change the structure a bit. Let's no longer include that section in the transaction like we usually do and instead include it somewhere at the end of the block without it being necessary to uh, end up putting the, that information in the blockchain. And this obviously means that you're going to be able to fit a lot more transactions on each block or on each page, if you will. The miners, on the other hand, say that, yeah, 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 sure, we want to do this. But aside from that, we want to also increase the size of each block from one megabyte 
to two. And this obviously means that you can fit even more transactions in. But logistically speaking, this does mean that miners are going to have to upgrade their infrastructure. And it's something that favors the huge miners compared to the smaller ones because they have enough financial firepower to do so. And yeah, this is the point at which the two parties say we do not see eye to eye. And as a result... As of the 1st of August, it may very well happen that two distinct blockchains will exist. In other words, two new currencies will appear, which share the same past, so the original Bitcoin, but one of them is going to have the framework that the miners envision, and the other one is going to be, if you will, the standard Bitcoin. Finally, let's see what would happen in the event of a fork, and as mentioned previously, two new currencies would effectively exist. They'd have the exact same past, but different futures. So what I mean is that if you have a balance in Bitcoin right now, then you'd have the exact same balance in Bitcoin number one and the exact same balance in Bitcoin number two. However, as of the 1st of August, transactions that take place with Bitcoin number one are not going to appear in Bitcoin number two and, of course, the other way around. And what this effectively means is that... If you have access to your keys, so if you have a paper wallet, a Bitcoin wallet on your computer, phone, and so on, then you're going to be fine and you're going to be able to spend your Bitcoins in both of the two currencies. However, if you have your Bitcoins at an exchange or in an online wallet, then you're going to depend on the policy of the company in question in that they might, of course, allow you to spend the Bitcoins in both places, but then again, they might not and simply pick a favorite. It's all up to them. And with that stated, I'm going to move on to providing a few final tips. And I'll start with number one, if at all possible, try to avoid Bitcoin transactions around the date of August the 1st, because you never know what could happen. And the last thing you want is to have your Bitcoin stuck in limbo due to all sorts of potential glitches. So if you can avoid transactions around that time. Number two, try to keep your coins in your own wallet, so in wallets on your computer, on your tablet, on your phone, or in paper wallets. I would say you'd be playing it safe by doing that. And number three, if you insist on keeping your Bitcoins at exchanges or in online wallets, make sure to do your due diligence and find out what kind of a policy the company in question has in the event of a fork. And with that stated, all I can say is good luck. That's it for today, guys. Thanks a lot for tuning in to yet another edition of One Minute News from One Minute Economics. And as always, please like my videos, comment, be active in the community. And if you haven't by now, subscribe to One Minute Economics. Also, if possible, try to develop the habit of telling your friends and contacts about the One Minute Economics YouTube channel, because even a quick tweet or a simple share on Facebook does wonders. And finally, those who want to support the channel financially as well can do so by buying my Wealth Management 2.0 book, which I think would be remarkably useful for people who have done well with cryptocurrencies and want to manage that money wisely. Or of course, you can simply donate through PayPal, Patreon, Bitcoin, and so on. For more info, please head on over to OneMinuteEconomics.com. Thanks a lot, guys, and have an awesome week.